Hey, it's Tom here, and welcome back to another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. Now, in this episode, we have a fairly popular returning guest in Jason Rothman of the After Dinner Investor. Uh, some of you may be listeners of Jason's podcast, or you may be familiar with episodes uh, in the past on this uh, particular show where we've had Jason on. Uh, he's also a pretty regular guest over on the Punch Card Investing uh, YouTube channel. And we covered uh, quite a bit on some businesses that Jason has been really interested in recently, uh, namely Racist Logistics, a, a Turkish business, uh, which Monas Pabrai has a pretty significant uh, investment in. We also talked through Paramount Global, um, a bet that we think is probably Warren Buffett uh, at this point at Berkshire Hathaway. They have a big position in Paramount Global as well. Uh, we also talked through Cardlytics, a more speculative position uh, of Jason's, uh, as well as uh, Carvana among some of the audience questions we took from Twitter towards the end of the episode. So uh, a lot covered in this particular podcast episode with Jason. I think you will really enjoy it. Uh, just before we get into the episode, um, as always, uh, any time we're talking through individual stock investments and stock ideas uh, on the podcast, uh, it's purely entertainment and educational purposes only. Uh, it's not a recommendation to buy or sell or anything like that. Um, but I think Jason's a really interesting guy who uh, dives deep into trying to understand the nuances of individual businesses. Uh, and I always like uh, like chatting with him. It's always a fun time. So uh, with that all said, I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, and let's roll this one with Jason Rothman, the After Dinner Investor. <laughs> Jason Rothman, the After Dinner Investor. It's been uh, about 11 months since we had you on the podcast. I'm feeling like the uh, before breakfast investor this morning. You got me out of bed early with the uh, with the time difference here, but it's great to have you back on the show. How, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm excellent, and uh, it's great to see you. Uh, we, we do see each other every now and then on Punch Card, but you were telling me we had not done this since July of last year, so it's been a long, long time, and when I got that message from you saying, "Hey, you want to come on the podcast?" Um, best day, best day of my life, Tom. So I'm I'm very excited to be here, and uh, it's it's just always great to talk to you. Love it. Well, uh, we've got a lot to get through, but before we get into some of the questions, it wouldn't be an after dinner investor podcast without doing a super investor sip. So um, okay. I might hand it over to you to to run us through that avid list as of your podcast. We'll know exactly what this is all about, and if they don't know, they should they should go and listen and find out. But yeah, uh, I'd love to. So us. everybody, grab grab your favorite drink. Mine is coffee uh, this afternoon. My time, I have a water. Tom, what do you have? I have my second coffee of, of this morning. <laughs> okay, we'll call it the second coffee. Yeah. And let's remember the three things that Ben Graham taught us. Number one, a stock is not just a piece of paper. It's ownership in a real business. Number two, Mr. Market is there to serve us and provide us with opportunity and provide he did uh, over the last six months for me. And number three, always invest with a margin of safety. So with that said, take your super investor sip and let's become super investors together. Okay, I think we nailed it, Tom. I think I think it works. I think we did. I must say that I'm saying this with complete seriousness. I like 80% of the podcasts I listen to, including yours, uh, usually when I'm driving. Um, and I always have my water bottle kind of sitting in the middle of, of the car. So I always bust that out and have a sip, you know, mid-drive while I'm listening to the podcast. So I'm always making well, good. sure it, it can't. It, it, it works. You know, the super investor sip, you can look at my results over the years, how they were not so good. And then I kept sipping and then they've become uh, pretty good. One thing that's funny, Tom, a side note, um, I say, remember the three things that Ben Graham taught us. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Monish had a lecture recently where there was a fourth thing that Ben Graham should have taught us, but he didn't, which was that I think like the majority of his investment gains came from a wonderful business, Geico. Mm -hmm. So, but he didn't really uh, talk much about that, I don't think, but that kind of uh, colors all our minds here in terms of like uh, cigar butts versus wonderful businesses. And uh, I thought that was an interesting aside. And I have not mixed that into the super investor sip, but maybe... One day I will, because I think it's super important, you know? Yeah, I, I remember that pretty clearly, actually. I think it's buried right at the end of The Intelligent Investor. He just spends like one page on it or something after after this yeah. entire super dry book on um, pretty old school value investing. He kind of just throws it in there that they bought one stock and that, that accounted for 
I don't know, 50% of his lifetime gains from stocks or something crazy. Well, it's something I try to keep top of mind because if you're in this space, if you're reading about investing, reading about companies, looking for undervalued stuff all the time, the mindset is always focused on like this business, that business, how undervalued is it? And a lot of the thinking is about today and is it's about the present. But I've been trying more lately to really think about the runway, think about decades from now, thinking about business quality. And there's a very strong argument that like, yeah, you can look for undervalued stuff and you can trade it out every three years and look for more undervalued stuff and do great. But there's also some argument out there that's like, you know, focus on those business winners and you're not even, you're not going to be able to model Amazon or model Microsoft because you don't know how big cloud's going to be, but you know, they're winning in it and you know, they're maybe expensive, but like still not crazy expensive right now. And we could wake up in two decades and they, they could just totally get better results for you than if you just did the three year thing. So I'm not in one camp or the other camp totally, uh, but I am trying to kind of always remind myself um, runways, wonderful businesses, business quality, price doesn't matter so much when you get the wonderful businesses and just trying to trying to keep that top of mind because it's not very um, intuitive or it's le- it's it's easy to lose that train of thought in the day to day investing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, let's let's maybe roll into a business that some people have argued is maybe like the best of both of these worlds of the, um, you know, uh, really undervalued, but potentially quite a high quality business as well. Um, Are you pushing Alibaba right from the start, Tom? No, what are we doing? I'm, I'm not. All right. I'm not. Um, I want to talk about uh, racist logistics. This is, um, okay, you know, a- avid Pabri followers will, will know this. Um, will know this pretty well. Monish has been talking a lot about it in the last couple of years, probably at this point. Um, and the stock's been on a tear. I mean, I'm looking uh, yeah, it has. in US dollar terms. Uh, it, it's obviously up more in Turkish lira, but if you account for inflation and things, even in US dollar terms, I'm seeing it. It's up 384 percent in the last year as of recording. Um, and I know probably somewhere along that run up in the last year, you made it a pretty sizable position. I think I personally, did, yeah. if you if you look in the after dinner investor portfolio on your website, it's a massive position. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what's what's happening with racist? What's the the underlying thesis, and what's kind of been happening there recently? Well, I'll kind of talk about what's happening with the business uh, and the stock price, and then maybe I'll talk about what's happening with me personally, and they're sure. they're kind of tied together. Um, and but before that, I did I did make it a huge bet. So summer of twenty one, Monash starts talking about racist. Uh, Monash starts also using this story and this phrase, which I I always misremember the words that the order of these words. But I love, I just love the phrase and it's so good. No matter what way you say the words, it sounds great. So like the way I say it to myself sometimes is uh, people will ask him like, how do we become like you? How do we become an uh, investor? How do we do these great things in life? And the answer to those kind of questions is always like, nobody knows. You just have to try and figure it out. Everybody's path is different. <clears throat> but the way he's been answering those kind of tough to answer questions is like, it your, your wish it's like your your wish is your desire, your desire like your will is your your wish is your will, your will is your desire, your desire is your destiny. And I'm getting those in the wrong order, but again, no matter how you say them, they sound good. Around the same time as he was talking about racist, he was t- saying that, and those two things just clicked for me. And I was like, when I heard him talk about racist, and at the time it was a hundred thirty million dollar market cap, replacement value, book book value, net asset value. 800, 700 to 900 million at the time in the summer of 2021. And I was like, I've got to figure out how to buy this stock. I've got to figure this out. And so I just made it my wish, will, desire, destiny. And I did. And I continued to hold it. It did well. Um, But then in November, around Thanksgiving of 2022, so not that long ago, um, I told the story on my podcast. I was in the Maryland area, Washington, DC, I was walking around a neighborhood late at night. It was, the rain was coming down and I just was like listening to Monish lectures about racists. I was seeing what happened with racists in my portfolio, basically a double at that point, maybe, maybe a little more than a double, but I had made it a big position. I was like, wow, this, this is crazy what happens when these things work out. And then I was also reading a lot of Munger at the time. Like, you know, 
it's not easy to get rich. You got to take advantage of opportunities when they come. And I was just walking in the rain. I was like, I'm going to do this. Like, I'm not going to let this opportunity go by. Um, and I made it uh, like a 30 or 33% position in the portfolio and personally. Um, and then from November, it's it's gone up a lot. And so I'm still holding it. Why has it gone up? Um, nothing's really like there, there, nothing's really changed. Like there's still inflation in Turkey. The business is still continuing to do good, uh, and, and really good. The, the management who are co-owners with us are really, really good. And they're doing things all the time. Um, what were the catalysts? It's hard to say, like they, they put out new values of their warehouses, updated values. And I think the market like that, but as I said in my podcast, somewhere around like <clears throat> December or January, I just think it's time. Like, I think this thing is, had been so undervalued that the more people heard about this, the, there were just going to be people around the world that figured this out and more money was going to flow into this, this stock. And I think that's pretty much why it's, there's been a run up in price. I don't, it hasn't been like, oh, we announced this deal or that deal and they were the major thing. I think it's just more people are hearing about how undervalued it was. Um, so that's, that's what's going on with the business. And the, the management, uh, the son of the father-son team, he bought a lot in 2022, um, and he's continued to buy more um, here just a couple of weeks ago in 2023. Yeah, cool. So um, I'm, again, I'm just looking at prices for people that are less familiar with the situation. Since November, probably roughly a double as well in US dollar terms since the kind of big addition in that ballpark by the looks of it. Yeah, let's look at it. So, well, it, so November, yeah, mid-November, it was at about a dollar in US and now it's a dollar 93. Yeah. So uh, about a double. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And um, I uh, I guess you, you spoke about the market cap versus net asset value and the kind of big um, disconnect there. Um, I guess a couple of questions on that. One, how are you arriving at that liquidation value? Is that like straight from owners or have you done other work on that? Of races, uh, you mentioned they've published some documents around net asset value. And how has yeah. that sort of spread changed as the as the prices come up as well? Has that changed your thinking with holding on to this? So the way I'm getting there is 100% with Monish. I, I did this beautiful Paramount write-up. It got over 70,000 views on Twitter. It's this eloquent write-up. If I was to write it up for racists and put it out there, which I might, I have a superpower of judging people. I cloned Monish. I did it in a big way because I try to be like Charlie Munger. End of the story. It was a shameless, intense, ferocious clone. You've seen the mug I've made and gifted to a handful of great investors out there. Uh, it was a shameless clone. And so um, Monish lately has been saying uh, replacement value, which I'm reading as book value, net asset value, $1.5 billion. It may be a little more than that. That might be a depressed market right now. Uh, the market cap today is like $500 million, uh, U.S., so there's still room for this thing to run. And then, like you said in the intro to racist, it's not just about the balance sheet. It's also the management and what they're doing with those retained earnings. And <clears throat> Monish has a lecture out there where, or many out there where he says like, these guys, the, the manager, the, the father, he doesn't think in terms of like IRR, what, whatever, all these financial terms, but he knows when he puts a dollar out, he wants that dollar to come back uh, w within a year or two. And so, they compound capital at the number I use is always 25% or more. And as long as they're doing that, uh, you would think over time, the value of the business is going to compound at 25% or more. Uh, very small company, very big country, very uh, important industry logistics inside of a very important place in the world between Europe and Asia. And they've got a lot of things going for them on top of, um, just like apparently like really, really magical, talented management. And it's one thing to just say that, but it's another thing when management owns 30% of the business and their whole life is tied up in a business in, in the business, just like yours is. And that's what, I, the, that's the number one thing I look for as an investor these days. I want businesses where management are true co-owners with me and in the same boat as me. And that's what's going on at races. So for myself, um, when we get to a billion, which is a double from here, and then maybe we get to 1.5 billion, I'm going to, and maybe 2 billion, I'm going to have really, 
really tough decision on my hands because at that point you take a third of your money and you put it into something and then it goes up from originally 130 million. And then I bought a lot more at uh, 250 million. If that thing goes up to a billion, 1.52, it becomes serious amounts of money. At the same time, when do you sell a business when it's selling for book value, when they compound at 25% a year? You don't. So I'm going to have to walk that line and, and figure things out. It will probably end up in some kind of trim um, and I'll let the rest run. But uh, but that's what's going on. Those are my thoughts on kind of what the next year or two could, could look like. Yeah, cool. And um, I mean, obviously, this is like a super volatile stock and it's hard to access and it's relatively illiquid and a whole bunch of other things. Um, I mean, if if racists would like just to get cut in half from here or we fast forward to 2030 and it's up like 10% or something, you know, like something really disappointing. And is, is this the type yeah. of thing you could see yourself just holding on to still in a big way in the portfolio and just kind of really, I guess, anchoring yourself to that net asset value and letting it play out for a long, long period of time? Or how are you thinking about it? Well, the crazy thing is, is um, if this thing went down by half because of some crazy issue outside of the business, mm -hmm. and I was able to see that Monish was holding, I was able to see that the management was holding, and with the management, we might see them buy more. And you can see that with the filings in, in Turkey. Um, I, I, I'd be inclined to buy more if it had nothing to do with the business. Um, so I'd probably buy more if it went down and I was prepared for that, like going into this election. Um, there were a lot of people that thought like if Erdogan lost, uh, people would be more comfortable with the economic situation and the stocks might go up three, four times overnight, uh, or within a very short time period. I was prepared for that, but I, I was also prepared where some people thought if he won, which he did. Um, the market wouldn't like that because um, the unorthodox economic policies would continue, which That's why I thought them that, <laughs> that, that did not actually that did not end up happening because he won. But racist continues to go up. And I was thinking, why did that happen when I was prepared for this thing to go down even more? Nobody's home, Tom. Everybody already left. So anybody who was going to be scared because of that was already gone. Like the foreign investment in, in Turkey is down like over 80 percent. Um, from like 2017 or 2019. So it's just, they're all gone. Um, so the stock did not have. And on top of that, I think the market could have been reading this wrong. When do you need low interest rates, Tom? You need them when you want the economy to not crash, when you want the economy to continue to at least grow and do good uh, from a growth sense, despite inflation, which is this, uh, the state they've been in. Now that he's done what he's wanted to do and he's won and there's talk that the, the guy he's looking at bringing in for economic policies is more of a traditional guy. <clears throat> that guy's saying, Hey, if you're going to bring me in there, I need some, I need to be able to do this my own way. I need that authority. And of course the articles in the market is saying, well, no one believes that's going to happen, but it very well could happen now because the election's over and maybe they're going to be focused on more like getting inflation down for the people. And um, at some point, that might make the international investment community feel better to see those interest rates go up a little bit, inflation come down a little bit, even though Racist is not a company that's negatively affected by inflation, which is the whole deal. Um, a bunch of foreign money might flood back in. Uh, so I think the market might have been reading that election wrong, but I was prepared for it to go down 50% to buy more. That is was my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, we've got one more question on uh, racist, and then I want to move to some other businesses you've been um, quite interested in recently. Um, Jason, I know this, you know this, the people that listen to Punch Card um, will know this, but uh, you know some high-level people. I'm not sure if people are... Yeah, DC, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know some high-level people, and um, a high-level person that, that both of us know, we'll leave them unnamed, I think, on the podcast, but... Um, it is a mutual mutual connection of ours. Uh, he went and met with racist management in Turkey, and they busted yeah. out the paper presentations. It was pretty old school. Um, he he came to some probably slightly less, um, well, certainly some much lower net asset value figures than what we've seen the likes of Monish throwing around. Um, yeah, did that change the way that you're thinking about this at all? The the low lower valuation did not. Um, I know. I know there's reasons why that is. I'm not going to get into them, but it did not. It does not bother me when I see those figures out there. But I was introduced by this uh, connection through you, so maybe 
maybe if you introduce me to high level people, maybe you're the highest level person, but <laughs> I appreciate that, Tom. I had a man on the ground in Turkey because of you. Uh, very great guy. Um, and he, he gave me a lot of time at odd times of the day with all the um, time changes. And I really appreciate you making that connection him for uh, communicating with me. And we had some great calls and must have been weird for my wife, Cynthia. Like, what's it like to be married to me? Like, you know, it's like midnight and I'm like, hey, I got to take a call from Turkey. And so um, the, the coolest thing about that was, I think, like the mementos. Like, apparently in Turkey, the investor relations stuff, it's not like put it out online so much. It's like they hand you booklets of yeah. printouts. And he, he, he mailed me some of those, which was awesome. So I've got those sitting in my office for a couple different companies. Yeah, we were getting, um, and we it was, were getting photos on WhatsApp of all these like paper presentations. And he's kind of like, lot, yeah, lots on, of yeah. different pages. And uh, yeah. now I've got a couple of the hard copies. And yeah. uh, it's just, it was really cool to hear like, you know, these are real businesses. These are real managements. Um, Monish just talked about the management quality across a lot of these businesses in the past and our connection talked about that as well. It was interesting to hear the differences in cultures uh, at the different companies. And then it was also interesting to feel the, to hear what it felt like being on the ground uh, before the election. So it was very, very cool. And it also made the world uh, quite a bit smaller, you know, for me. It's like when you use the internet the right way, when you treat people the right way and you are able to make friends, this world can really uh, shrink on you and, and you can do a lot of cool things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're joking around about high level people here, but uh, the person we're talking about, we'll leave him unnamed. I don't know if he wants to be named on the episode, but um, he's a subscriber of, I think, both of our podcasts and YouTube channels. And I actually meet him in person at the virtual meeting. So it's very yeah, cool and to that's, see those that's another, turn out. One thing that summer. stuck out to me, Tom, is uh, he, he, I was like, you know, man, thank you so much for it. Cause he really gave me a ton of time. He asked questions I wanted to ask and just like really helped me out because at the time, uh, there was a lot going on with, um, there's just a lot going on. And I, I, it was very reassuring, honestly, to be able to get that on the ground uh, answers. And he told me like, uh, Hey man, what you and Tom have done with your podcast and you've been willing to share so much, like I'm happy to do it. And that was a little light bulb moment for me. It's like, and I got a nice message the other day from someone else with the podcast. Um, they were just saying like, you know, keep doing, keep doing it. We appreciate you sharing so much. And it, it just shows that like, I don't do it for those reasons. Um, like, oh, people are going to give stuff back to me and that kind of thing. I don't do it for that. But it is a very cool thing where like you put a bunch of positivity and there's a big one. Monish talks about a lot. Honesty. You put honesty out into the world and people like that. And then um, they have good feelings about you. So it, it all kind of comes around. Yeah, it is very cool. Hey, Jason, I, I want to change to a slight to a well, a much different business here. Um this is one you did an episode on pretty recently on your podcast. Uh, I think you've been in and out of it in the past. I uh, recently got back into it, as I understand it. Uh, and Berkshire owns a significant chunk of the company now, and that's Paramount. Um, yeah, Paramount Global. Give, a, give us some uh, maybe the background on what Par what Paramount Global is, what they do, Um and why is it sort of so out of favor and something you're interested in at the moment? Yeah, so they're a media and entertainment company. They own CBS, which is one of the three big networks in the United States. Um, they own a bunch of ca uh, cable channels, Nickelodeon, um, BET, which they're looking at selling right now, um, Comedy Central, um, among many other things. And previously they had been CBS and then a company called Viacom. Viacom was the cable company. CBS was CBS. And um, Berkshire, interestingly enough, had actually been in Viacom in 2012 and then sold some in 2015. So they had been, been aware of this company in the past. But um, Sumner Redstone, he passed away. His daughter, Sherry Redstone, she took over the business. Their company, their trust, National Amusements, owns the majority of the voting stock in Paramount Global. So it's like the Redstone family company, if you will, but it's a public company. And... Um, Sherry Redstone a couple years ago um, merged the companies. She merged CBS and she merged uh, Viacom with CBS because in this whole streaming area, you need scale. And uh, th there's a great book called Unscripted by maybe the best business writer ever, James Stewart, in terms of just, in, he's just a great writer. So I'm reading that right now. And that, that book goes into all of what happened when they uh, merged the companies. But I see Berkshire buy it. 
And uh, by the way, what's going on with the company? They make tons of free cash flow from CBS, from the cable channels. They get paid by advertisers. They get paid by cable and satellite companies. But as we know, cord cutting, people going to streaming, everything's changing. So they've come out with two streaming products. One is free. It's called Pluto TV. They bought it in 2019. They took it from 12 million monthly active users to 80 million. Um, And that's free and they make money from ads. And then the other product is the big one, uh, Paramount Plus, 60 million uh, global subscribers. Uh, It grew by 4.1 million in the last quarter. Uh, Fastest growing streaming platform right now. And um, they're on their way with that. And so the whole situation is they're losing money in streaming. They're losing a lot of money in streaming right now. 2023, they've guided for a while. Is the peak streaming year? peak streaming investment year and they say they're on they're, they say they're ahead of plans with like revenue and um subscribers and the whole point is can they make this transition from linear s- satellite and cable where they make a ton of money to streaming where maybe the upside's bigger it's global it's easier for people to sign up you have a direct con- consumer relationship but right now they're losing money and can they grow that business to scale and make money Gets a little more interesting with that because if they don't make it, uh, they can still sell off parts or all of the business because there's so many assets, which we can talk about. Um, Berkshire bought in early 2022, $25 to $28 a share, somewhere around there. Um, I cloned them in 2022. We get into early 2023, and I had cloned them with stock, but also leaps, Tom, uh, long-term call options. And the stock had a run-up in early 2023. This thing was my personal piggy bank every day. Every day, the leaps would just go up 20, 30%. I would sell down to my cost basis and just pocket that money and put it into long-term stuff like uh, Amazon, Racist, and some other other things. Um, and then that ended and it kind of stabilized in the low 20s. I saw some other stuff to do. I sold it. I lost some conviction on it. Um, and then I bought other stuff. And then... I just had a relook at the company Uh, and what also helped is the stock price dropped 30 percent when they uh, lowered their dividend by 79 percent so they could continue streaming investments stock price drops i understand the situation better it's cheaper um berkshire we see them buy in q1 a little bit more and i get back in there and we've also seen uh, sherry redstone buy uh, some more recently but basically i got back in there on that price drop um I'm keen to get into some of the details on uh, upside and downside and so on for Paramount. But um, before we get into that, do you just want to give us your two cents on who the hell at Berkshire is actually (laughs) buying Paramount and um, some of the weird stuff that that Buffett's kind of said in interviews over the past couple of months about it? Yeah, so for all of 2022, they were quiet about it. No one really asked them. And I think it's safe to say we... Um, guys like us who are in this space every day, we all assumed it was Ted Wessler because yeah. he had that interview with the um, Nebraska, NFM podcast, Nebraska Furniture Mart, Berkshire Meeting 2022. He did their podcast, Berkshire Meeting 2023. Todd Combs did their podcast, recommend both um, episodes. Tom, I recommend you get Todd and, and Ted on here as well on your podcast. So you should reach out. <laughs> These are good interviews. You should reach out um, and try to get them on here. But Ted Wessler did it in 2022. And he talked about, uranium today uh furniture weekly and he also talked about reading about streaming and all the streaming space is so interesting it's global and he talked very positively about streaming and then we see them buy paramount and we're like oh he's the one that bought it and it was like uh before the price drop maybe all in they invested 1.5 1.8 not 1.5 but 1.8 2 2.2 billion if he manages 17 billion it would have been like a 15 percent bet seems reasonable enough that it was him with the big bet. It's a little small for Buffett. Mm. But so we all thought it was uh, Ted Wessler. And then Buffett gets asked about it by Becky Quick in Japan. He starts talking about it. And we're like, why is he talking about it whenever yeah, it's Ted or Todd? Yeah, yeah we're, he's always like, you got to ask one of the guys in the office. Yeah. And he's like, I don't know anything about it. You got to ask them. It's like, you know a little something. Can you tell us something? He's like, no, you got to ask them. But he starts talking about it. And that was weird. It's like, did Buffett buy it? And then he, um, she was like, well, you gave all the negative reasons why someone wouldn't like streaming, but you keep buying this business. Why are you in it? And he was like, well, we'll see what happens. It's like, Buffett is a we'll see what happens guy. Like, what's, <laughs> what's going on? 
So then he kind of says the same thing at the annual meeting um, where he, he talked about it uh, again. So was it Ted Wushler? Um, Tom, was it, uh, was it Buffett? Was it Ted a little bit? And then Buffett, then maybe he sold, who knows? Maybe he's still in it. And then Buffett added onto it. Or was it Buffett the whole time? Really have no idea. Um, but I think it's safe to say at Buffett's at least involved, right? Yeah. Because he's talking about it. It seems like it, it would be a massive change in like how he's, how he's talked about Ted and Todd investments in the, in the past. Um, you know, that, that said, it is, but like at the same time, I saw another old Ted Wessler interview out there uh, with Buffett and with Todd Combs where it was on, um, I forget where it was, but it's from a while ago. But he mm-hmm. says he prefers to be the largest shareholder in a business when he when he buys it. And of course, it's going to happen a lot at Berkshire because they're investing so much money, but they are uh, the number one outside shareholder at, at Paramount. So um, that would line up with him. And then like, I think... The direct TV stuff. I was going to say. Um, I think the Liberty stuff. I think that's been um, Ted Wessler, I think. So this would kind of be in that space. And then, like I said, I learned in that book that they had bought Viacom in 2012 um, and then sold at least some in 2015. So it's really hard to know. But the nice thing is, I look up at my Mount Rushmore and Buffett's on there and Ted Wessler's on there. So I'm cloning both of them. Um, but the, the interesting thing to me, the more interesting thing is the we'll see what happens. And listing all the negative reasons and then still continuing to buy. That gets us to the potential merger workout here, if you will, the potential sale of this business, um, which gets us to uh, the Merchant Bank and Michael Dell, that partnership that recently invested in. I can get into that if you want, Tom, but there's been moves in the last week. Yeah, well, maybe we should just start out with... um let's just start out with the streaming part because Buffett's been sitting there saying this is a terrible business. Um, I think uh, a lot of people kind of just assume Netflix has already won like the quote streaming wars. They've got the most scale. They charge, I think pretty much the highest price. There might be some smaller players. You know, funny enough, Max feels like they can charge the same amount as Netflix. So yeah, but I love with that. Yeah, but it but it sounds like you're in a similar camp even with think with saying like Netflix has probably won the streaming wars, but that's because Netflix is a streaming business, Tom. Yeah, and whatever the hell Paramount Plus is, it's not streaming. I'm, I'm, I don't put them in the same category. Paramount Plus, Max, these other these other Terrible companies name, that are not Netflix. <laughs> All right, it's wherever it's everything's in one place or whatever okay. their uh, tagline is. But those businesses, uh, Peacock. It's not to say they're going to be bad businesses. Like they can work, but I call it like a new form of television. Like you turn on your TV, you want to watch the NFL on Paramount Plus, it's there. You want to watch other shows, CBS shows on Paramount Plus, you want to watch Showtime stuff, Nickelodeon stuff, it's there. And I do it all the time. But it's not the best user experience on any of those platforms compared to Netflix and YouTube. Uh, This means YouTube TV, this means YouTube itself, and this means Netflix. Their DNA of their company being tech companies and the amount of money they've generated and the amount of money that they've been willing to invest in technology, the user experience is so much better on those businesses as a customer. Those guys actually do have pricing. I pay 12 bucks a month for YouTube premium, so I don't have to watch ads, Tom. Don't tell them this. If they bump that up to 55 or 75 or 100 next month, Daddy would eat some less food. Like I'd be paying for YouTube premium no matter what. They have pricing power. Um, Netflix has pricing power. Part of it's the content, but part of it also is the user experience in the tech. So those guys won the war. They're already both producing tons of free cash flow, and they're willing to spend more than anybody else on content. So because they're spending more than anybody else on content, which is what drives eyeballs, which drives ad revenue, which drives subscriptions, they're already spending more than everybody else. And they're still producing cash, which nobody else is to a real extent. Max did 50 million in the last quarter, but like not billions a year. They've won the race and their tech dominance and the way they're, they're just, they invest in their, it's over. They won. Hmm. But the, so streaming to me is over. They won Netflix and YouTube, but there's this new thing that's going to be happening with TVs. No one really knows what to call it. Some people call it fa- uh, fast, free ad support, streaming television, where you just turn on your TV, you turn on Pluto, you see TV, uh, and then 
you have ads and that's what pays for it, but you get it for free. That might end up happening with all this more premium content where uh, maybe you don't pay anything and you still get all this stuff for free, but it's paid for through ads, or maybe you pay a little bit and then the rest is paid from ads or you pay a lot and you don't have to deal with ads. That's kind of where things are going. And these other businesses, Peacock, Max, uh, Paramount Plus, I don't count them as streamers because they don't have that DNA, that tech with them, but it's like TV adjacent. It's like new TV. And right now they're not making money, Paramount Plus, but they could over time. And it could become a very good business. It's not right now because they're all not charging enough. And also, this is a big thing, there's not enough ad revenue right now in, in that ecosystem. But when there's more ad revenue and more of it moves over from linear, when the ad market comes back, when the advertising product is more developed for advertisers and there's more eyeballs, it, that's going to go a long way with making new TV uh, as opposed to streaming, but new TV um, kind of a grown-up business where these guys make profits. And it could be a great thing because it's global. The the way they run advertising is better than linear because people can't skip the ads. There's more targeting options. There's more measurability. And if they make it through this period, that, that could be a great product. And the global thing also matters a ton. Like it's just like back in the day, they had to get a cable company in the United States to go to someone's house and then share that money with the cable company. Now, all they need someone anywhere around the world is to just go to their phone or go to their TV and go, yep, sign up. Here's my credit card. And it can be a great business, but it's not, it's not today. Like they're losing money. It's very early in this game. Hmm. So uh, I think he had quite an interesting perspective given the, uh, you know, Netflix well in the lead on streaming and, and some of the things he just said, I think he had quite um, an interesting perspective on sort of the range of potential outcomes here for Paramount around yeah. whether they continue to go kind of full steam ahead in streaming, whether they, completely give up and go back to some of their more traditional businesses he run us through um sort of the different potential outcomes in your head and that how that influences the like investment result as well yeah it's, it's a 10 billion dollar business equity uh with around 16 billion dollars of debt two two billion dollars of cash that debt goes all the way out to like 2062 um which is crazy and it's sprinkled all the way throughout there it's all fixed rate and the average rate is like six percent um, so that eases one's mind about the debt, uh, somewhat, even though they probably need to get that number down and the market would, would like that, but that's the situation with price. Um, the outcome is this, um, there's three scenarios where they win three times. It can land on heads one time. It can land on tails where they lose, but I don't think the lose the loss situation is ever going to happen in reality ever. So let's go through those. So the number one is that lands on heads scenario one. Paramount Plus works. Paramount Plus continues to layer on two, three, four million subscribers a quarter, continues to grow faster than any other streaming out there. Um, and they turn the corner. Uh, it becomes one of the top two, three streamers in the world in a, a decade from now. If they do that and they are able to play with Netflix and YouTube, they're going to have pricing power. It's going to be global and it's going to be a wonderful business just like Netflix is. If that happens, it's going to be a truly wonderful business and, and a truly home run investment. So that's one scenario. Um, and I don't even know if that will happen. I don't, I personally don't think the odds are likely given the, given how tough it is to become Netflix or YouTube if you're not. So it could, but I'm not banking on it. The second scenario is streaming works enough um, and what I call new TV works enough. They get to profitability. Maybe it's not like the old days with linear, but it's profitable. You still have cash flow from the old old school stuff with cable and uh, satellite. Maybe churn stabilizes to some extent. I saw an interview from like five years ago with John Malone, and they asked him if if cord cutting will slow at some point. And he thinks that, he said he thinks it would. Now five years is a different world, but at the same time, I've thought about it, and you have a bunch of like. Older people who love cable, love satellite, don't want to mess with the new stuff. And maybe as the cord cutting comes down to that last kind of tier, maybe it stabilizes a little bit more. So you have that. And then the ad market comes back and things work out. And if they do that, there's some analysts out there that think they could earn $4.50 in three to five years per share. $4.50 times 10, that would support a $45 stock price. 
that's a compound rate of like 23 to 46% per year from here over three to five years. And, so that's scenario two. And Paramount is roughly $15 a share today, just 15 bucks a share. Yeah. Reference. Yeah. Cool. So that could go up, it could go up to 45 bucks and, and be a, a very good investment. Third scenario is streaming does not work. And 2023 was supposed to be the peak investment year. They have trouble raising prices. It doesn't work. Everyone's worried. They don't have any more money to throw at it. And they decide, you know what? End of the road. We're going to sell off a bunch of assets. Maybe we sell the whole business. And if they do that, I think it can be a two to four bagger uh, from here. Maybe only a double. Maybe it gets sold at 30. Maybe it gets sold at 25. But from these this price of 15, uh, that can be an attractive investment. That can also serve as a margin of safety. And that can happen any time between now and the next few years. It could have, we could wake up any day and that could happen. Um, there's some news that uh, Michael Dell, the, the Dell guy, and a, a merchant bank that is the guy who runs that, Byron Trot, is known as Buffett's Banker, which was interesting. If you look that up, you'll see his nickname. Those guys came in and they just invested in National Amusements Incorporated, which, own, which is the Redstone Trust, which owns um, the majority of the voting shares in Paramount. And basically what they were able to do is they were able to go into National Amusements and say, hey, we're going to invest with you with this preferred equity. Use this money to pay off your loans. Uh, so those Paramount shares that you own that are pledged against those loans can be freed up. And now if if National Amusements wants to, if the pair, if the Paramount shareholder base wants to sell, there's nothing slowing us down in that department. There's no loans tied up with banks because National Amusements had loans or anything it's we're free now to do that and in some of these stories that are coming out about that deal someone was quoted um off the record as saying uh national amusements is open to looking at strategic alternatives so they're looking at selling bet right now they might get they might get over three billion dollars for that maybe uh they're they're looking at selling simon and schuster they might get two to 2.5 billion for that that's potentially five billion dollars of value on this 10 billion dollar market cap it just it just for two assets that are not core to the product that they're selling, that just shows how much is tied up in here. And whether they sell in pieces or they sell outright, there's a lot of value in there uh, compared to a $10 billion equity and, and even when you look at the debt. Um, so that's the third scenario where I think you can do well. Fourth scenario, similar to number three, streaming doesn't work, but they don't accept it and they just keep piling money into it. And the stock goes down by 50% over the years because the business has horrible results and the market gives up on it. Yep. Tom, I don't ever talk in absolutes. I'll talk in an absolute right here on your podcast. That's never going to happen. Bob Backish, the CEO, he owns like $30 million of, of stock. If this thing gets to where it should be, uh, his share is going to be up at $100 million. That's real money. Uh, Sherry Redstone, through the trust, she owns at least $200 million uh, at today's prices of uh, of Paramount, they're they're not going to do anything stupid. You've got Buffett in there owning fifteen percent, whatever the business. You got Mario Gabelli in there, sixty million dollar investment or something like that. It's not going to happen. We're not going to do anything dumb here. So because of the margin of safety, because of the assets, because the price is so low at a ten billion dollars equity, I don't foresee any world uh, where I lose here, um, Tom. We, we follow Buffett. Anything can happen in markets. We have to remember Buffett teaches us that. So anything can happen, but I feel very comfortable about the downside, but I feel uncomfortable owning the stock. It sucks like to see, to know that they're losing money on streaming, to know the market's going to bash on that. It's a little bit uncomfortable to own. And I saw a great quote out there from Buffett uh, yesterday that someone had it on Twitter. It was like, you want a stock to feel a little uncomfortable when you own it. You don't want the market to be celebrating it. And that's how I feel right now, but I feel very, very good about the downside. So those are the those are the four scenarios where the worst scenario, the only bad one, will never happen. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting way to look at it. look at it. It's it's very much like the I think you even mentioned heads and tails there, but like the uh you know the the minus quote from Dundo Investor: "Heads I win, tails I don't lose much." Um, and and price is so important to this, Tom, because I've yeah. run the numbers. You can play around with the assets. What if they sold all this stuff and they're just left with CBS and the movie studio and some debt. What would that company be worth? And you can make a case for $10 billion of equity value. If this thing was selling for 20 billion or 25 billion, 
it gets a little bit tougher on the, oh, we can just sell our assets and we're going to be fine and not lose anything mindset because the price would be double to, to two and a half times where it is now. That just shows how important the the low price is to this investment thesis. Yeah. So it sounds like the, I guess the main concern for you is that kind of one downside scenario potentially of they just keep plowing money into streaming and it doesn't work for a long time. Is there any sort of time frame you've got in mind around like when you'd want to see either they're doing well or, you know, they kind of throw in the towel? So 2023 is very important. They've been guiding for a long time on their calls. This is going to be the peak investment year. So does that mean, and by the way, on the last call, they also said, we are ahead of schedule with our plans for revenue subscribers. And I don't, I can't remember if the word profitability was in there, but they're ahead of plan. They're ahead of schedule with their subscriber base. And they, they've got probably models that say like, okay, if we get this many subscribers per quarter, and then at this point we raise our prices and we lose this many subscribers due to that raise, but then we keep adding some, we're going to be making money. Like they plan this out and they say they're ahead of schedule. If so, will be, will we be break even in streaming in 2024? I don't know, but if we have larger losses into 2024 in streaming, that to me is a bad sign because that means they were wrong about this being the peak investment year. So I'd like to see the losses as we get more into 2023 and then out of 2023 come down. Um, and if they don't come down because the world's an interesting place and things happen all the time and there's a valid reason why they didn't come down, then I would get it. But if it's just like the same economic environment we're in now, and the losses just keep piling up, then it'd be like, you know, what what the heck's going on? Okay, so so you think it's like a, a you know, in a year or a couple of years, something's got to give, basically, if streaming doesn't work. That's Correct. Sort of right. About it. And and honestly, at this point, with this uh, the the bank and and the MSD investment into them, into national amusements, and then the way Buffett's talking, I have a feeling, and, and also knowing the streaming space. Uh, and knowing how much of an okay, I'll give you the example I gave on my podcast. They have a beautiful live TV uh, aspect of their app where you can watch live CBS, uh, other uh, content they own, and you can flip through channels. That does not work on Apple TV for me. I've tried on multiple TVs. When I go to the channel and then hit back, it doesn't work. You have to like get totally out of it, go to a different section, and come back. It's ridiculous. It's it's utterly ridiculous. And I messaged them about this. They they haven't done anything. You just know if this happened to YouTube or Netflix, their tech, their hardcore business mindset is strong enough to go, this is unacceptable, fix it. And we pay you a lot of money to fix it. If you don't fix it, you're gone, but you're going to stay because we pay you a lot of money because you're the best tech talent in the world. That's not going on at Paramount, uh, apparently, because they're not they're not doing that. So it's such a hard thing to compete in um, that I, 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 I think a sale's coming. So I don't know if it's like they sell off all the cable assets or all the channels, all the content, and then they spin out CBS and CBS becomes its own standalone again, because that might be a hard thing to sell with regulations with all the local broadcast markets. It might be messy, um, but I foresee a sale. But, but at the same time, I love the optionality because I could be wrong. Like just because I get annoyed about that back button with a uh, live TV, they do have the NFL through 2033. They do have three Super Bowls through 2033. They have a ton of great content that I watch that we turn on Paramount Plus a lot. Maybe the streaming does work out. And because we have this sale in our back pocket, um, we can we can try to make the streaming work. And it might work. Um, but if I had to bet right now, I would say a, a sale might be coming. But we'll see. Yeah, cool. Um, just before we move on from Paramount, I want to co cover just a couple of small like nuances with the Berkshire holding. Um, I think you said they own something like 15% of the yeah. business at this point, but I understand there's a couple of different uh, classes of shares. And one, of, one yeah. of the weird things about Berkshire having that bigger position that we don't see is we don't seem to get Form 4 filings, which you know usually when a company's over, I think, before. 5% ownership, they have to turn around and tell us. 10% for Form 4 10%. when they trade, and then 5% on the proxy. Got it. Okay. And they're not yeah. on the proxy either. Yeah. So, so you know, we're having to wait till the 13Fs with a 90-day delay for um, 
vote. It's it all it's all about the voting shares. Yeah, I, I was wondering this too, and I looked it up throughout the year. You, if you don't own voting shares, apparently you don't have to do form fours, and you don't show up on the proxy. Interesting. And I think the ticker is P A R A A. I'm pretty sure about that. Is the voting, um, and then P A R A is the non voting. Okay. So does that mean there's some um, like there's some shareholders that have more modest, you know, ownership percentages of the overall company, but presumably they have a bunch of voting power? Is there anything like to be concerned about there that you've picked up? No, uh, in in that I'm I'm going to pull something up here as we're talking to get you the exact number. Uh, basically, this National Amusements Trust, which is Sumner Redstone, he passed away, so it's his family and some other. Uh, trustees that he's he brought into this. Uh, they own this thing called National Amusements, which is a movie theater chain, which is what he built this whole thing out of. Um, and I think there's still a movie theater chain uh, that's out there. Uh, and, and it's not in my area, so I'm not so familiar with it um, geography-wise, but apparently it's still a movie theater business. That trust owns that, but they also own this stock uh, in Paramount. And they own... Uh, the, the, there's 40.7 million class A shares and those shares have one vote. And then there's 609 million class B shares, um, which is, uh, which don't have votes. And so basically when you, when you add up that trust, uh, I think the trust, if the company is worth 10 billion, um, I, I think the trust is, it's a little under the, uh, it's a little under ten uh, percent. It's like forty-one million out of six hundred and fifty. Um, so it's still a ton of money. Like it's still a billion or almost a billion dollars. And then Sherry Redstone owns twenty percent, at least twenty percent of that trust. That's two hundred million dollars. Um, so in a spot like this, you could be in a situation like I, I've seen this happen in other companies that I was thinking about investing in. When those, I've I've heard of like bad stories where people who own the voting shares can sell the voting shares to someone and then they participate in a higher share appreciation and you don't because the your shares just transfer to the new owner of the voting shares. I've heard of something like that. I've, I've never seen it, but I've heard it as a theoretical. In this case, I am, I am not worried about that at all, at all, because of the way that uh, Sherry Restaurant handles herself in, in public. I, to me, she has the utmost credibility. Um, and then the fact that Buffett is happy to be a non-voting shareholder or Berkshire is, I feel totally fine about the situation, but I like where your head's at because, uh, it's something you want to be aware of when you're getting into a spot where you don't own votes. Yeah. Cool. Um, any final thoughts on Paramount that you want to share? Um, I, I think it's a super interesting situation, um, because it's so dynamic where it, it really could, they really could make streaming work, new TV work, but they also could, we could wake up and this stock price could go up a hundred percent tomorrow. If, if they sell off a major, major part of the company. Um, I, it's just a very interesting situation. I would share that what I'm looking for, what I think are short-term catalysts are this BET sale. Apparently they were collecting uh, bids from multiple bidding parties uh, in May and they were due in late May. And so maybe soon we'll have news about that as we get into June. I've been looking, I'm looking for a 3 billion number there. If we have 3 billion on that, man, I feel very, very good about the assets we own. Um, and then Simon and Schuster, the book publisher, if we can get 2 billion for that, I'd feel very good. We might have news on that layer this year. So those are the short term catalysts though, that might make the market feel better about the stock. Yeah, cool. Um, I want to keep moving here, Jason. We're <clears throat> we're covering a lot of ground, but uh, there's some, there's some interesting businesses you've been talking through lately, and I want to keep keep plowing through them. So, um, next one wow. is 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 Cardlytics. You had a very good podcast episode a few weeks back with uh, Austin Swanson, who just knows Cardlytics inside out. <laughs> I'd, I'd yeah. heard it mentioned here and there. I'd seen it in the likes of uh, Cliff Sosen, 13F. I think Matt Peterson actually had had a small position in it in the past. Um, yeah. It seems like there's a lot of overlap. I don't know why. Maybe you can tell us, but it seems like if you own Carvana, you own Cardlytics and vice versa. I don't know what's going on there, but um, yeah. can you can you run us through what Cardlytics is, what they do for people that haven't heard much? Yeah, let, let's, 
let's talk about the overlap. It's super interesting. It does seem like that. I own both myself. And mm-hmm. what's going on is people who are attracted to each of these situations, they're 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 basically um, they're very similar in the sense that this is Silicon Valley. This is uh, private equity or not private. This is uh, whatever, whatever those guys call themselves. This is private equity, whatever. This is investing in early stage companies who have who are losing money today, who know they're going to lose money, who are planning to lose money, who have absolutely massive runways because it's such an early stage and they're going to disrupt industries. This is like the rare time that these are actually public companies. I don't know why it ended up working out that way. I don't know why these are the two that ended up being the two, but that's why the same people are attracted to these because it's people who, the way their brains work, they can see... The, they can see the forest for the trees. They can go, oh, okay, we're, we hurt, we're losing money. It doesn't screen well. Like we have to make some assumptions to understand that for us to get there, wherever there is. But if we get there, the market that we're going to tackle is going to be absolutely huge. What are those profits going to be like that we can't even see today, but what are they going to be like in 10, 15 years? And then you discount them back today. And there can still be value investing in that space because you can look at, well, what do they own? What does it work to someone else at this stage? But that's that's why they're attracted. And then even on a further level than that, there's an interview with Eddie Garcia out there um, where he's saying that uh, he, him and his team, they tried to start some kind of offer company that was similar to Carlytics before Carlytics and it didn't work out and they learned a lot from it, but it didn't work out. And he said in that interview, Carlytics ended up winning. So even the the players in the space were attracted to the same kind of like businesses. So there is, there is totally uh, something to that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay. Well, well, what's what's going on with Carlytics? Yeah. So what's going on with Carlytics is um, you have a company that was started by two people that worked at Capital One. And I guess a lot of people at the time knew that um, the data that banks had was super valuable in terms of the purchase data with the card transactions. And if you could advertise based on that, uh, you could do very, very well. And I guess a lot of people tried to start this. Carlytics was the only one that ended up making it. And uh, basically, you, you go into your bank app. Uh, the banks partner with Carlytics. Uh, Carlytics partners with the advertisers. And then you get offers inside of your bank app. And it says, if you go to this store, you get 10% cash back. And all of that is done across the many different bank apps and bank companies that have it. It's all done with Cardlytics. And they're like the white label partner behind the scenes. Um, And it's like one of these win, 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 win uh, scenarios. The advertisers win because they get a proved, not just a return on ad spend, but an incremental return on ad spend. If you did not advertise to this person with this exact ad, and this offer, would they spend this money at your business over the next six months that produce these amount of profits? Apparently, they can prove that, and they can prove that with third parties. So advertisers win because of the high incremental return on ad spend and the very high return on ad spend. The banks win because they get to monetize their data in a very safe, with a very safe and trusted partner that they know is not going to have any data issues. And basically, they get to earn a fee uh, for those eyeballs that they have in the bank apps and also the uh, the um, the uh, data that they have. On top of just the fee, which which is very nice, they also get more engagement and they're able to offer a better product to their bank customers, which has bank customers checking the app more. I see this myself with being a new Chase customer. I check the app more. I start seeing about these $500 offers. I start seeing about these credit card offers and you get higher engagement. So the banks win. Customers win because you get cash back, uh, 10% back, sometimes sometimes a lot more, 5% back, 10% back. The, the customers win because you can go where you want to go, click these offers in your app, use that card, and then the cash shows up in, in your account. Um, and then the uh, Cardlytics win because they put this all together with their technology and they get to share in that advertising revenue um, with the banks. And that that's kind of how the business works. Um, and even though it was started, I think, I think it was 2008, but it was started a while ago. Um, the, the, the first phase of the business was building the product. 
And super important here, Tom, gaining the trust of the banks. And for a long time, their only uh, biggest bank partner was Bank of America. They've added Wells, they've added uh, J- uh, Chase, but and they have a lot of other smaller partners as well. But for a long time, it was just gaining that trust and building the product. And it took a, it took a very long time to do that. Um, but now that they have the trust, now that they're in with the banks, it's about tech and it's about advertising and it's about making the tech product better for customers, the way it looks, the way it feels, wanting to use it, driving that engagement, and then um, making it better for advertisers, giving them more options, making it easier to set up campaigns, uh, making it faster to get results and measure things, uh, reaching out to more agencies to, to get this done, uh, longer term, more self-serve with smaller businesses. Now it's about making the product better. Um, and we have a new perfect CEO to do that that came in last year. Uh, Karim Temsamani. He worked at Google for over a decade and uh, did a lot of things there. And then he worked at Stripe for, I think, two or three years. So he's like the perfect combination of advertising technology and payments. Um, and you can tell he knows what he's doing from uh, from the calls and from watching his moves uh, to date since he came in July of 22. That's the business situation. The price situation is th- this thing went along 2020, 2021. It shot up like a lot of things did. And then 2022, it came all the way down and it was down like 96, maybe more percent. And I'm Mr. Lucky timing. That's when I, that's when I came across it. That's when I came across Austin. That's when I came across it in a real way. I had been, uh, I had known about it in the past, but now I came across it in a real way, had uh, read some other people, um, on Twitter. There's a great, uh, Twitter guy out there named uh, Indra Stocks, and um, I recommend everyone check him out. He had a write-up on Cardlytics on Substack right around the time I saw Austin. It all came together, and um, I looked at the price, and I looked at why the price was so low by by listening to what Austin was saying about this earnout situation with one of the companies they acquired, and there was all this uh, drama, and there was going to be an earnout, and what did they owe for it, and the market thought it was going bankrupt. Austin, through his Substack and his videos and podcasts, was saying like, no, if you look at the filings, I think there's a really, really, really good chance they're going to be able to make it out of this. So I stuck with it for a few weeks. Um, Goes up like 80% very, very quickly. Um, And at that point, I had a decision. I was like, is this a trade or is this an investment? And I trimmed a little. I put that into Carvana um, and I kept the remaining as an investment in Cardlytics for the long term. Um, and right now it, it's all about just, they, they have the users, 180 plus million users, three of the four uh, biggest banks, a lot of bank, smaller banks across the country. They can still add banks, but they have so many users now. Uh, now it's about monthly active revenue per user and um, getting more engagement, getting more advertisers. And if they can get that ARPU up to like $2, $3 or $3 to, to about $5. The investment can do really, really well, like really well. And if they can ever get it up to North American Snap, North American Pinterest, North American Facebook, somewhere in that, and those are very different numbers, by the way, but if they can play in that field, um, it could be a thousand bagger based on the price I bought it at. Uh, from a $150 million market or $120, $130 million market cap to one day it could become hundred billion dollar business. Uh, I could be sitting on a thousand bagger. If it doesn't become that, it could become a high 500 bagger could easily become a 10 bagger. So that's kind of what I'm sitting on with, with card cardlytics. And that's, that's the situation. Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> the price on this thing is it, just looks crazy. We can talk about that a bit more in a sec, but it looks like the all time high in Feb 21 was about $157 a share. Uh, it got down to two. So, yeah, yep. just crazy how much that's come down. It's about five dollars a share, kind of as of recording. But um, just before we get too much into the like investment, I guess case, um, can you just talk me through what the economics look like for all the different parties involved? So for the yeah, um, you know when uh, Dunkin' Donuts seems to be the example you love to use talking about <laughs> talking about catalytics. Yeah. But if Dunkin' wants to run an ad using um, 
you know, using offers in a chase app or whatever, and Cardlytics is driving that, um, you know, where, where does the money flow? Who kind of captures what in, in that equation? So, so I go into my chase app to see if this bill got paid or whatever. I go in there. Oh, it got paid. Oh, and then I see this offer thing. It says, go to Duncan and get 10% back cash back. So then I'm driving down the other day, we're going to the grocery store. We pass Duncan. But Duncan's top of mind because of, or not even top of mind, just subconscious. It's in my mind now because I saw their picture, their, their advertising in the app. And then at some point, this happened the other day, uh, on the way home, I go, oh, you know what? It's early in the morning. Uh, let's let's surprise everyone with a donut and uh, let's get that 10% back and have some fun with that. So, and I know we crossed it on the way there, so we'll go back and drive back by it. So we go to Duncan. Um I give them my Apple Pay because I have that card saved in Apple Pay and it still works with Apple Pay because the card is still being charged. So I turn on the offer in my app and then I, I do the Apple Pay. And if you want to swipe the card, you can swipe the card, but I pay with it. And let's say I spent $10. Um, so I get a dollar back. Um, that dollar goes to me. Um, and that, that that's my dollar. To get this campaign going, Duncan would go to Cardlytics and, and give Cardlytics three dollars for me personally and they would say here's three dollars cardlytics give this person ten percent back so i spent ten dollars i get one of those three dollars the other two dollars uh that are left over from duncan's advertising spend the numbers are a little bit different than this but essentially half of what's left over goes to the bank partner and they get a fee right there that dollar and then half of what's left over um, goes to Cardlytics and, and they make that money as their um, gross profit. And for Duncan, they get to go, oh, we spent $3 on this person, on this advertising. We're able to prove over the next X amount of months, this person is going to spend $15 on Duncan that they would not have spent otherwise, incremental ROAS, incremental return on spend five to one, that they would not have spent otherwise without uh, having clicked on our offer and spent with us, um, in this offer. How do they know that? I think they brought in Nielsen as a third party. And that to me is a great word, like just Nielsen. They have a great reputation, great brand. They brought in a third party and they're able to essentially, like, we all think we're so unique out there, but they're able to see people who are in my age range, people who spend the kind of money that I spend on morning breakfast, fast food places or coffee places, people who live in this area and they're able to like put us in buckets and they go, oh, this this guy is compared to this bucket. And on average, he would spend this much at Duncan over the next six months or year. He actually ended up spending five times that um, because of this offer. So that's how it works for Duncan. But that $3 that Duncan put into advertising, one goes to the, the customer and then what's left over, uh, the other um, two thirds, half of that is split uh, with Cardlytics and the bank partner. Um, and for Cardlytics, the bank partner and Cardlytics revenue that they split the non-consumer offer part of it, the two thirds of the advertising, bed, that's their revenue. Um, they don't count that uh, consumer offer as, as revenue. Got it. And um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but as I understand it, Cardlytics made some sort of acquisition recently. And this, I don't know if this is related to the yeah. earnout drama or what, but that, it is, yeah. that, that acquisition allows them to get data not just on duncan's probably not the best example but say i think target is an example that's been used rather than saying um we want someone to spend money spend money at a target store generally and target has obviously a massive like wide range of products they can drill down mm -hmm. into the individual types of products that customers are spending on as well yes they my understanding is they they can go to the individual product level with this company they acquired called bridge mm -hmm. and how bridge works i do not know uh, but it's got something to do with the point of sale system, like the cash register and the customer data and the, uh, software, you know, like who, who, I don't know how they do this, but apparently they do it and they're able to get individual, uh, product data versus when I go to target and spend all the bank can see is that I spent $40 at target. They don't know what I spent on an individual level, but now that they've acquired bridge, they can create advertising products that say for an advertiser like target. If you want to offer 
because maybe they're having, they want to drive people to their home goods section. Mm -hmm. If you want to offer 15%, something you could never offer for store wide because their margin overall is like three to 5% or whatever, um, or 7% or 10%. You can offer more than that on just home goods, home goods at targets. My understanding is you can go farther than that and say this specific kind of bread at target. So now that allows different, um, companies to work with retailers to say, hey, let's drive this individual product we're trying to drive, creates all types of options. So that shows how early uh, this business was in its in, in its uh, stage here, like what stage they were in. A couple of years ago, they did not have product level offers. They still don't have product level offers for a ton of their bank uh, partners because you have to be on this new server. You have to, I think, be in the new customer uh, interface here. But even those things, like right now on my experience on Chase Chase offers, all I can see is the Dunkin' Donuts logo. All I can see is the Arby's logo. And on the new customer experience, you can see, you can swap in different pictures. You can test different pictures. You can put in pictures of food as opposed to just the Arby's logo. You could have a great, nice sandwich there. And it just opens up a ton of different options, including um, product level advertising. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, it's such a good idea. I mean, and investing. Oh, okay. Like, Tom's getting excited. No, investing completely aside, like um, okay. for an advertiser to be able to go in and do that type of for target to do that type of targeting, uh, that is yeah, yeah, that's pretty impressive technology. But um, well, and then from an investment perspective, you think about where else are they able to do this? Oh, nowhere else because this is a bank form of advertising. Mm-hmm. Who else are the banks working with right now? They're not working with anybody else. And it's very much a situation where it, if it works out, it, it could be it could be amazing. The question is, will it continue to work out? Will the banks continue to stay with them? And what you need from here, you just need pure just execution. You need a manager to come in there and serve these bank partners, serve these advertisers, make the product better and better. And essentially the job is to just like, that just execution. They just have to make the product better, serve the bank partners the right way, make the banks happy, keep them happy. And if they do that because of the product enhancements, because of the increased engagement, because of people using bank apps more and more, because of more advertisers getting on there, because the offer is getting better, We should see that ARPU go up. And if it goes up from here, from this stock price, um, it it could be explosive, the stock price. And they're very, very close, Tom. They're very close to being free cash flow positive. Um, That could come in Q4. It could come early next year, um, but they're close. And so um, it's a situation where I don't know exactly how it will work up or work out, but I, at these, at this price, I had, I had to buy some given the, given the runway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Um, I've got a I've got a few different questions on here. I've got four or five I want to get through on Catalytic, so we'll see if we can knock these out. Um, but there's a, few, there's a few things that um, kind of immediately spring to mind when you think about the way the business is structured. But there's some other things that have just been drama around the whole situation. So, um, can you give us a, a very quick run through of this whole burnout situation? Um, what it is, recent developments, uh, anything that you're concerned about moving forward, or is that something that's kind of behind Catalytics now? Totally in the past now. Um, it, it was a very, for some people, like I was following Austin, it seemed like he had a very good uh, grasp on the situation and he knew where he was at, but the market overall was very felt very uncertain about this. It had to do with this acquisition and the acquisition was paid for a lot with stock and the amount of stock was going to be based on increases in revenue over two different, it was just like, it was very complex, like very complex. And uh, the good news is it's done. Like the ruling came out. It's, it, it, it was, uh, it ended up being a good spot for us, a good situation. And the point is we have the liquidity to handle it and there's not going to be massive dilution on the stock. So from my point of view, this is in the past now, and it's not nothing to, nothing that I'm worried about. Okay, <clears throat> cool. Um, the other one I just want to get your thoughts on is uh, you mentioned they're working with, I think, three main banks at the moment, uh, Bank of America, mm-hmm. Chase, and Wells Fargo. Um, does that mean, like, essentially they have just three customers and they're, like, crazy concentrated into... Integer. Not just three, not just three, but they do have those three guys make up a lot of their customer base. Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. It might be something like 70%. They're major, major customers. Um, 
They do have a lot of other bank partners, but those banks are smaller. There are other bank partners to get out there, but even when you get them, those three will still be very, very big. My reading on the situation that is if two of the three left, it ain't looking good. If one of the three left, we could still have a real business out of it based on uh, based on the current equity value. That said, they they have to make the bank's lives better with card lakes in it in their life than without them and they can do that based on the amount of advertisers they work with and the only reason the advertisers work with them is based on the amount of users they work with so for a long long time they only had bank of america and apparently for advertisers it wasn't enough like advertisers needed more and it's kind of not intuitive because you think about like 30 50 60 million people and you're like that's not enough really Apparently it's not uh, for the kind of granular granular targeting you want to do here. Because when you want to target people who live in a certain area that spend this much on fast food places uh, for lunch, but they don't spend it yours, apparently it gets to a very small amount of people very quickly and you need massive scale to do this. So the reason the product works is because you have that scale. So if a bank was to go out there on their own, maybe maybe with enhanced technology and all that kind of stuff in the future, it could be done. But that's where I'm getting back to just make the bank's lives better with Cardlytics in it than without the, without Cardlytics and let the banks enjoy all this uh, user data across all the different bank partners. And they can all make better fees than they could <clears throat> otherwise because the advertising product is stronger, which attracts more advertisers, uh, which attracts more money for everybody. Not to mention... Uh, you don't have to have the hassle of working with advertising firms across the country. You don't have to have the hassle of the technology. All that is taken on by Cardlytics. And if you think about it, when else do banks get in businesses that are outside of banking? Um, like, it's just not a thing. Like when they, when someone, they foreclose on a house, they sell the house. Like they're just not interested in doing things other, other than banking. And there's also like a regulatory issue where like when you're a bank, you're regulated in such a high way that when have you ever heard of a bank slash advertising agent? I, I haven't heard of that. So it is a risk. It's always a risk. It's always going to be there. Uh, but some people feel very, very fine about it because they understand the dynamics of scale and they feel like a bank could not go on its own because the, the product won't be strong enough. By the way, I think there's American Express offers out there. They kind of do this themselves. I looked at it the other day and I, I did not, it was not, engaging to me. Like it did not draw me. The offers did not draw me. So there's other people that are trying to do this on their own. Uh, and Ameri- American Express might end up being a partner of Cardlytics. So we'll, we'll see. Um, but it, it's just, it's just a risk that, you know, that you, you have to live with if you're going to be a Cardlytics shareholder. Yeah. It's just interesting. Like, I mean, I just pulled up JP Morgan Chase here, like $400 billion market cap. The, like you'd think if, if they want to build something like this, they've they're going to have the cash to do it, but it sounds like they they'd struggle to they'd struggle to attract well they, advertising they can build they can build it, but what are what what does it look like? It looks like I don't know what their monthly active users are, but say it's thirty million or sixty million, mm-hmm. it's that amount. It's not one hundred eighty plus million. It's not going on to two hundred million, and therefore you don't have the level of data um, that Cardlytics has because they have what without them maybe one hundred twenty hundred thirty million or over a hundred million. And that data matters because that data allows the advertising to be perfect, which is what the advertisers want, which bring the advertisers. So it's, it's very much one of these, like it all can't happen unless every part of it happens. And that's at least the theory of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, Maybe one last question on, on Cardlytics and then we might jump to some Twitter questions potentially. Um, Yeah. But, just on the whole free cash flow situation and also share dilution, uh, like you mentioned, how big um, you think Cardlytics could potentially be in the future if it works out um, on a market cap basis. But um, I guess we're buying shares, not the market cap. So if there's more shares in the universe the, and the market cap yeah. goes up, the per share results aren't as good. Um, the dilution on this thing in the past, at least, has been crazy. I'm seeing uh, at the end of 2016, there was about, I assume this is in millions um regardless that we get the point um she's outstanding around 2.4 million back in 2016 
it's like 33 million today that she's outstanding or up like 15 times over the past you know six or seven years is that yeah. over now like are they going to be at a point where they can fund the business from cash flow or what's going on the, the, my my answer is is probably probably over there's this uh convertible debt 200 million that they're going to have to take care of in 2025 if that converts to equity then there's going to be more shares outstanding but at these prices apparently it doesn't make sense for those debt holders to convert so i want to be worried about it then um if, if the stock price is still low um and there's other things they can do. They can, they can, at that point, they'll probably be free cash flow positive and they can raise other debt and then pay off that 200 million. And we are very, very close to being free cash flow positive, like very close. And so I don't foresee a lot of dilution. Um, but this gets us back to why people are attracted to this business and some people aren't. And same thing with Carvana. The, the word I was looking for earlier, Tom, I think was venture capital. You have private equity on the East Coast, but then the West Coast is known for venture capital. This is what happens. Like the last decade of this company where there was shared dilution, that's what happens in venture capital. People invest in different rounds and then yep. the company needs more money because they're getting more scale. So they dilute the share count, but it's better for everybody because the company gets bigger and, big, bet, bigger, and bigger. It's just rare that this happens in a public company. And my understanding is that to build this product to, to continue to build the product to build the technology to continue to be there while you're working on those bank relationships um it took a ton of money is what i've heard from other like from great investors it took a ton of money and that's why there was shared dilution over the years um yeah. so i don't expect that to to continue but i'm going to put the word probably on there because we don't know where things are going to be at in 2025 and or what's going to happen with this uh convertible debt we just know that it seems like we'll probably have a lot, some different options to be able to take care of it. Um, but mm -hmm. share count diluting could be one of them. And I think in this earnout situation, it might be something like 10% is going to be the dilution from that, I think. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the situation there. Yeah. I mean, for, for what it's worth, the I'm seeing shares outstanding up about 3.8% in the last 12 months. So it's no longer compounding at 40%, <laughs> the, the right, shares out. Right. So hopefully it's-, it's And and we've got some restricted stock units for management, which I like because we want these guys. I mean, we got some very, very talented, this uh, Karim Temsamani, Tom, and the guys he's brought in, very, very talented and perfect for this moment when the focus goes from generating the bank relationships and gaining that trust to- which is what I think the former management was perfect for. And that's why they started the business to a new era of maintaining that trust, but improving the product for customers and advertisers and improving the technology. This is the perfect management now for that. And we, we got to pay them so that there's going to be some stock dilution there. Uh, and, and that was one of the whole theses of this investment. They've done the hard part, getting in with these banks. That's the hard part. Um, and this stuff about making the product better, putting in pictures, individual product advertising, now that they have bridge, all that stuff is very, very difficult, but it's easy compared to gaining the trust of banks. And they've done the hard part. And so now it's time to improve the product and grow the ARPU. And uh, that will lead to more uh, real free cash flow that will be huge compared to the current equity of the uh, stock. That's the, that's the thesis in a nutshell. Very cool. Um, Jason, I'm probably going to have to run in about 15 minutes, but should we jump to Twitter and take some, take some questions? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. We've got a, we've got a wide range of topics in the, in the Twitter questions. A lot, lot of engagement on Twitter, Tom. I don't know what's going on there, yeah. um, but I'm feeling it myself with my own Twitter. And then when you put that out there, I was surprised at the number of questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. Uh, at Tom investing on Twitter and at after investor. Is that right for you? Yeah. Without a, hey, hey, uh, Tom, without the question mark at the end. I don't okay. know why you had to throw that question mark and throw people <laughs> okay. off. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, link in uh, yeah. description anyway. I'm messing with you. Yeah. If you want to follow follow along with what we're up to there. Um, let's maybe just knock out a couple questions on Paramount because we've um, covered that uh, in the episode, but a uh, slightly yeah. different question here. So this one's from Matt, uh, Matt Hanson. How discounted is Paramount's content on their books? Are they as cheap as when Buffett bought Disney in the 60s, i.e. getting Cinderella and Bambi, et cetera, for free? Uh, do you see parallels to this? Also, as he coming to the Punch Card Conference next year, he is the founding father after all. Tom, do you understand what he means by the founding father? Uh, you tell me. 
so I, I, I might bring tea time back, but I was doing tea time for a while and I'm the one that created the idea of the punch card conference. Mm-hmm. You, Jack, none of you guys are ever going to believe that. Um, you're all going to think it's your own idea five, 10 years from now when it just goes on year after year. No, I'm no well aware gonna, that no. it's your idea, Jason. Okay. So, you know, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. at least at this point, yeah, you still know and recognize it, but it's funny because I don't think everyone knows that, but I, I, I started the idea and I, yeah, but when sure. I say started it, I just put out there, like, hope everyone joins me at the punch car conference. Looking forward to the punch car conference. There was no question mark involved. Um, uh, but Hey, Reality is a weird thing that you can shape, and uh, it became a real thing. And Jack was at a restaurant with over thirty people in Omaha this year. Uh, yeah. Very, very cool thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope to be there. Um, and then, on the, in terms of the the way their content is is discounted, that did. I, I'm not thinking about that at all with this investment. That that's just outside of my circle of competence in terms of way of thinking, and it's not the way I was thinking about this investment at all. Um, this investment is kind of what we talked about. Um, with the different scenarios and the way the content plays a role in that definitely thought about the content, um, but wasn't thinking about it in the way it was, uh, discounted or amortized. Um, but the content did matter. Like the, the kid stuff on Nickelodeon to me is huge. Uh, like I find myself opening up the app all the time because it's, it's a very, um, safe content. It's content I feel comfortable with, uh, for my kids watching and it's content they love, like Paw Patrol and those kind of things. So I've seen that firsthand with the way they're able to make amazing content that parents are okay with, that kids absolutely love. NFL was a huge deal, having that deal through 2033. Uh, people love the CBS shows. People people really like Showtime. Um, and the, the, the kind of content and the way they're going about it, which is like, no, we don't have the edgiest stuff. Some of that is Showtime, but we're not going for like the edgiest, like, everyone in the country is talking about at the water cooler kind of stuff, which Netflix gets, which I'm sure Paramount wish they could do, but it costs a lot of money and they're not doing that right now. Their strategy is more like, let's get enough for everybody in the family where right now, 11 or 12 bucks, maybe one day, 15 or 20 bucks makes sense. So you have NFL for the dad, you got the CBS primetime shows for mom, you've got Showtime for the disgruntled, angry teenager, and then you've got Paw Patrol and the Nickelodeon for the kids in the house. You got a little something for everybody um, to where it makes sense and people want to watch it. So their content strategy was definitely something I was thinking about. And I, I think they have a great position in that market, like Netflix. And again, the fact that Max thinks they can charge the same as Netflix to me is crazy, but they're also charging 20 bucks a month. But uh, Paramount is not, is able to kind of slide under there right now. Like I think around 12 bucks a month for Paramount with Showtime with no mm-hmm. commercials. Uh, I think that's where they're going is 12 bucks. Uh, but to make money, maybe they got to be a 15, 20. Um, but that's, that's kind of the content situation. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think last time we had you on the podcast, we spoke quite a bit about oil, but we haven't talked about it at all just yet. Um, so let's take this one from uh, Jonas. Hope I'm not butchering that name. Uh, what are your thoughts on energy stocks at these prices? Uh, any updates on Ring Energy? Yeah, so I really like oil at these prices. Um, I really like the oil dynamic. Uh, I had a podcast my, many months ago basically saying that this was a generational opportunity in oil. What I mean by that is I feel very, very good about the fact that I'm cloning Buffett on it. That's number one. I'm cloning Buffett. He's buying more and more Occidental. They're up to 25%. They bought in the last few days, another 200 million. Um, So I feel like I'm cloning him. I'm buying Oxy. I'm buying a company called Matador Resources. Very interesting situation. Amazing manager, owns a lot of the company, um, has a great track record. I'm buying Ring Energy. And then there's this company called Vitesse Energy up in the Bakken in a North, in a in uh, North Dakota. They're a company that has a uh, non-working interest in a bunch of different projects and wells across the region. And um, I bought it. I was, a, I see this 10% dividend yield at the time. I see this kind of newer public company. So because it was spun off, I think from a investment bank, uh, I don't want to say the name because I'm not hundred percent sure, but it was spun off from, I'm going to say, I think it was Jeffries. I think, but I'm not hundred percent sure, but they spun it out great manager with a great track record. Um, I see insider buying. I see the discount to the PV 10, the standardized measure. It's like a lot lower than, uh, Occidentals. Uh, and it was like half based on like $90 oil. So I'm like, I'm going to buy this a few days later. It shows up in Berkshire Hathaway's 13 F 
with a $900,000, if I'm not mistaken, position. What is that about? $900,000. Am I wrong on that, Tom? Uh, I, I'm not sure on the exact numbers, but I know it was small. I mean, did they, did they just get the spinoff? Is that what happened there? Oh, this is, Hey Tom, this, this is why I talk to great investors like you. So I can look absolutely dumb in public, but end (laughs) up being totally right. I think, I think, God, you're such a smart guy. Tom. I think that totally makes sense. Uh, let me look and see, do they own Jeffries? One day we'll just, we'll get Ted and Todd on here. Just call them up, Tom. Yeah, no, you're so right, Tom. They own Jeffrey stock, and they get ended up with nine hundred thousand dollars of uh, Vitesse Energy. So there you go. Um, that's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do with it. Um, maybe they'll sell it all next quarter. Maybe not. Um, but that that is so that is so smart. One reason I missed that, Tom. There were other things going on with the Berkshire Hathaway 13F last quarter with this management company. Who knows what they got stock from some some stock they had in another unit ended up in the Berkshire 13 F and mm-hmm. it made it look like they bought more of some things, but they hadn't um, shameless cloning Tom, but you got to be smart when you clone just because something shows up in someone's 13 F it does not mean they went out and bought it at those prices. So this is a, a perfect example of that. Yeah, for sure. I, like there's other weird ones that pop up. I know Chris Bloomstrand's talked before about uh, stocks will show up in his 13 F that, he hasn't bought. He's just sort of taken on the accounts for new clients and they've got large capital gains that wow. they don't want to pay yeah. the tax on and weird stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, good point. Um, oh, but but oil overall, I feel like OPEC Plus is in charge. Um, I feel like the whole like U.S. Um, shale drillers are the swing um, producers. That ain't happening anymore. They're, they're sticking to... Uh, profitability. They're sticking to um, producing a ton of cash flow, not really growing their um, growing their uh, production. And um, basically, the my my thesis is the price of oil is going to be what OPEC Plus wants it to be. What some of those countries need to run their budgets is like eighty ninety dollar oil. I think that's where it's going to go and stay uh, in the short and medium term. Medium term, you could say. And if it does, some of these companies I'm talking about now with their focus on profitability and the way this industry has just changed in the United States. Um, I foresee really, really, uh, really not amazing hundred bagger kind of things, but good things. And I looked at my portfolio. I was out of oil a few months ago. I looked at it and the, some of the stuff I was into and not that many businesses, I was like, I need to balance this thing a little bit. And so that's why I brought oil back in and it coincided with a nice little drop in the price of oil to the low seventies, high sixties. And some of the equity prices like ring, it's just crazy to still see it at like a dollar seventy, um, dollar seventy four. So um, I bought those four, and I, I continue to buy. Cool. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we got a few questions on Carvana here, so uh, let's take this one from JPD White Long. Uh, what's happening with Carvana as a business? Uh, has the investment thesis slash outlook changed? Do you want to get into it, Tom? Uh, I'm going to have to go to my day job in about seven minutes. So, so right, well, let's, let's, let's in fit in the most epic comeback in the history of the world. That story, let's fit that into six minutes and 30 seconds so we can say goodbye at the end. But uh, a, a lot's going on with uh, Carvana Tom. And yes, the story has changed. Um, I've caught in the last quarter in Q1, I quadrupled uh, my investment in, in Carvana. And it's my second biggest position uh, behind Racist. And to me, it's gone from speculative to, oh, man, if it works out, it's going to be amazing. I hope it works out, to It's working out. And the story, to me, is written. And I I think they've made it. I think they've crossed over. The market can't see that yet. Uh, but if they have, the runway is huge. So um, just briefly for you, what's the story? Th- this company was focused on growth like nobody's ever seen in their life before the pandemic. Um, they would hire out and they would advertise in markets six to 12 months before they would sell cars there um, because they were focused on scale. They were doing other things, which I don't want to get into, which just shows like just how focused on growth they were, like just things you can't even imagine uh, to focus on growth. That was their mindset. It was all going according to plan. I did not own it at the time. I was not even that much aware of it. Um, but the stock price was going up a ton. They knew what money they were going to lose over time as they got for scale went for scale and they were losing that money. It was on plan. Um, but then the pandemic hit 
And early on in the pandemic, they changed their cost structure instantly. We'll talk about that in a minute because that plays on plays with what's going on now. But primarily the pandemic was what it was business was good during it, like really good because more people were thinking about buying online 2020. Great. Get to the end of 2021. And this beast called Omicron comes about and a, a third of their workforce called out of work sick during like Q4 of 2020 uh, or in Q1 of 2021 during Omicron. And that broke the system. Like they had so many extra costs, so much problems because of that, that issue. And at the same time, they were getting crushed with demand because of the pandemic. But Omicron, a bunch of people are out of the office, okay, or out of work. Uh, calling out sick, it broke. Comes out with a horrible quarter. Stock price goes kaboom to the floor, and that's where I see it. And I'm like, oh, you know what's going on? So I, I get involved with it at that point. At that point, we think Omicron will. Once that goes away, we're going to be back on track. But then the interest rates go up, and there's massive inflation with used cars because of the supply issues. So the affordability of used cars between the inflation and in price and the interest expense. It just crushed demand. And for a couple quarters, we were thinking like, well, overall, the market's down 15%, but we're up 5, 10, 15%, whatever. We're outpacing the market. We're, we're still growing market share. Let's do, keep doing our thing. Ugh. Didn't work. Still continued to lose a ton of money in an unexpected way. The reason why is because the cost structure was set up for more and more demand, more and more scale, more and more growth. But that wasn't happening now with interest rates and inflation. The, the demand broke because a lot, a lot of people talk about the coming recession, the coming recession. If you're in luxury houses like RH, if you're in used cars like Carvana, we just had the recession. Like because those two products are so interest rate sensitive and also they were affected by inflation and that affected demand, both affected demand. We had the recession and maybe that will look stupid to say in a year from now when we have a crazy real recession or maybe not. Maybe we have a decent landing and we just had the recession, but it was ugly in used cars. And what Carvana did in late 2022, they said, okay, you know, white flag, we accept it. We're not going for growth anymore. The market changed. We're going to fix our cost structure and we're going to get the profitability based on today's market. And we're going to be in control of our destiny. We're not going to give up this company to bondholders. And by the way, all of this coincided with the purchase of Edessa, which brought on more debt, which to me is a genius move and it will pay off over the long run, but rough timing when you take on all this debt right before this happens. So we get to the uh, mid and end of 2022 and they're telling the market, hey, we're going to fix our cost, stru cost structure. It's going to work. Let's fix it and be in control of our destiny at this level of demand. And the market says, you're not going to fix your cost structure. You're going out of business. And I say, I don't believe that. I believe the management. Why do I believe them? Because they're, they own the stock just like I do. They have massive ownership. And I think there's a good chance they can cut their costs just based on the people I was reading, based on investors I was talking to. And here's a huge thing, Tom. In the beginning of the pandemic, like the very, very beginning, when no one knew what was happening, they turned off advertising, they laid off a bunch of people, and they cut costs to the bone fast. And the business, the business didn't break. They were still able to sell cars and they were still able to get cars out there. Later on that year in 2021, partly because they caught cusp, but partly because of the demand, they got to EBITDA positive and they were on their way. So my point is, based on people I was reading and talking to and based on the track record of the business, having cut cost, I thought there was a decent chance they could cut costs. Okay, we get to Q4 2022. We're cutting costs. We're cutting costs. Still a massive loss. And the market hates it. And so now the stock goes down to three, four bucks in Q1. Q1 comes out and they start communicating to the market on what's going on. And I was reading, there's a great guy on Twitter and a great Substack called Implied Expectations. I recommend everyone checks it out. Um, he's writing about Carvana and he's looking at, during Q1, he's looking at it and he's going, you know what? Um, they're saying they're going to cut this much cost over like Q2, Q3, Q3. But if you look at what they're saying in the filings, they're actually well ahead of schedule. And if you look at what analysts think they're going to do on EBITDA basis and all that for Q1 when they report, none of the analysts are recognizing that. And the, the market uh, doesn't uh, 
the market doesn't either they don't believe it or they don't they don't have the courage to kind of say it. Basically, a surprise was coming. That's exactly what happened when Q1 was reported. They were ahead of schedule on these cost cutting efforts, and the stock is up 160, 170 percent year to date. Now, the getting to profitability and controlling their own destiny, it's a three step plan. Step one, positive adjusted EBITDA, which to me means slash fixed cost. Tom, they've cut over a billion dollars of cost in the last year, a billion dollars, and people are still going online, still buying cars, and it's it's still working. And so they, they, they're going to accomplish that this quarter as we speak here. They say at the end of Q1, they expect in Q2 that they're going to come out with Q, Q2 positive adjusted EBITDA. Okay, you know, Mitch, part one, fixed cost, get them down to this level of business, this lower demand level, done. That's apparently going to happen in Q2. The second thing is to drive significant positive unit economics. They're doing that. The third thing, and this is crucial to the last couple of days, being ahead of schedule here, is to return to growth. Once we get our fixed cost level appropriate for this level of lower demand, and once we get our unit economics better and, and improve based on cutting all these costs and improving things, once we like our model again, we're going to step back on the growth. And Tom, what they're doing in Tempe, Arizona, these guys, the way they think about growth and the way... They're, they're just aggressive on a level people can't even understand. When they turn on the growth, the growth comes. And when are they going to turn on the growth? They just did it. That was supposed to be at the end of this year. We'll turn on advertising back on. We'll spend a bunch of money and we'll bring people back into this very good model we have now for this level of demand. That was for later this year. Once again, they're ahead of schedule. They put out a press release over Memorial Day weekend. Carvana launches huge national um, national advertising campaign that is going to be based on their customer reviews. And I'm hearing from friends that people saw this on the NBA games over the weekend. They're turning the growth back on now, and the market doesn't get it. And the thing is, if this company can survive this period, the runway and the business model is so much better for customers. I, I just looked at this when all this was happening, and I was like, I cannot imagine a world where Carvana doesn't exist. It's such a better business, a better customer experience on the sell side and on the buying side. It has to exist. And during that time, the question was, is it going to exist in bondholders' hands or is it going to exist in our shareholder hands? Based on what I'm seeing with cost cutting, based on what I'm seeing with this plan playing out, I think it's going to exist in shareholder hands. Um Jason, we've run a couple of minutes over here, but I'm going to ask you one last question, anyhow. Um, I'm going to I'm going to modify this question. So this is from uh, this is from James on uh, on Twitter. The original question was yeah. uh, if they had a fight, who would win between a bald eagle and a kangaroo? James is from Australia. If you didn't get that from that question, I'm going to modify that to be if they had a if they had to fight, who would win between a bald eagle, a kangaroo, and a kiwi? I'm not even sure if you know what a kiwi is, but um, Anyone that does probably knows the answer to this question. But what, what what's your take on that? I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry, Tom. I know yes and and improv and all. I'm not going to entertain this question, Tom. <laughs> we cannot talk about fighting in this world, Australia and the U.S. We have, or sorry, New Zealand in the U.S. Uh, and we'll throw in Australia that we we have to be friends, Tom. So no more jokes about the currency. No more jokes about anything. We have to stay friends. Uh, we need each other, and I love Australia. I love New Zealand, and. I love everybody in those countries. So it was great to we'll, be on, Tom. We'll have to get you down here one day. I, I, I'm going to make my, my second trip to the States next year for Berkshire and the Punch Card Conference, of course. But so you're coming. You're, t- you're telling people you're coming, which means you're putting it out there, I'm, which means I'm you're forcing it. it out okay. Over and over. I love it. Here, so I'm, I'm going. I messaged uh, Hamish and Brandon yesterday to see if we book flights yet, but um, it sounds like maybe we're still a bit early for next May, probably. So. Anyhow, Jason, it was it was great to have you on here. I always enjoy chatting with you. For those that somehow follow me and not you, uh, where can people go to to see and hear more from you? Oh uh, yeah, so I have the After Dinner Investor podcast uh, wherever wherever you listen to podcasts, and then on Twitter, I'm at After Investor. <laughs> I think is what we called it earlier, Tom. After Investor on Twitter. Perfect. Cool. 
thanks so much for your time, Jason. We'll uh, we'll do this again soon. Hopefully, it won't be another almost a year before we, we get you on again. But uh, Tom, it was great, great to be on. Thank you so much for inviting me on. I love talking and investing with you, and uh, I hope to come back soon. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching another episode of the Investing with Tom podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can see future episodes as soon as they go live.